Hi, I'm Jimmy Coe. And I'm Stephen Hawk. And we're the host of the Cosmic Sponge Podcast, where we explore the unknown from UFOs and cryptids to unexplained disappearances and ancient mysteries. If you're looking for strange stories that will keep you on the edge of your seat, jump on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or search for Cosmic Sponge on your favorite listening platform. Head on over to our website at www.cosmicsponge.com to get access to all of our content, including a full list of platforms where you can enjoy the show. Hi, Techie Joe here. I work with Ace and Knight and some of the best psychics in West Virginia to create amazing live streams and podcasts for the Psychic Coffee Shop Network. Together, we brew up great content discussing news, events, hot topics, and more, all from a psychic perspective. On the Psychic Coffee Shop, we interview amazing authors in the metaphysical realm. Coffee and Tea combines Asen with Tracy, Dottie, Natalie, or Lady Gwendolyn for the good and the bad of being a psychic. Shameless self-promotion with Dottie the Psychic talks to leading and emerging YouTubers and business owners in our community. Mountain Bears brings you the latest in LGBT news and politics. The Psychic That Plans answers the question of, well, how a psychic plans. Plus, we're live on air. We take your comments and your questions, including psychic advice questions. Check out our amazing programming, book an appointment with top psychics, and find out all the wonderful things we have to offer at PCSBnetwork.com today. Tonight's episode is going to begin with a riddle. What do a chicken farmer, a serial killer, and an interior decorator have in common? At first, this may sound a little strange, but that, in fact, is what connects them, the high strangeness factor. Each of these people had an encounter with the other. Tonight, we're going to talk about alien robots, albino Bigfoot, leprechauns, and for members of the archive, a rather unsettling clown. All of this can be found in tonight's book, Just Another Tinfoil Hat Presents, by Zelia Edgar. I'm your host Jason, and you're listening to the Esoteric Book Club. Welcome back, Goblins! Tonight, we are taking a look at the book, Just Another Tinfoil Hat Presents, by Zelia Edgar. But first, I need to thank the members of the Esoteric Archive. Specifically, Annie Kay, Soul Rising Studios, and Grand Inquisitor Samantha. Your support helps me pay server costs, purchase reading material, and helps to fund a supply of decoy red balloons that make the creepy sewer clowns think that they've already visited my home. I assure you, I do not float down there. If you too would like to help support the show, you can find me at patreon.com forward slash esoteric book club. All members get early access to shows, and those pledging $3 or more a month get extended episodes just like tonight, with our super creepy clown. What do you mean that's not a selling point? Anyway, enough of all that. Let's get weird. Zelia's foray into the strange began with her research into her home state of Wisconsin. After about a decade's worth of research, she expanded into the high strangeness phenomena as a whole. She was inspired by a wide variety of paranormal researchers, but none more so than John Keel. In fact, it was her recommendation that got me to read and review the book The Eighth Tower, which is still in the top 10 most downloaded episodes for this show. Now, the book is published by Beyond the Fray Publishing, which is an offshoot of the show Into the Fray by Shannon Legro. This publisher releases a ton of works from modern paranormal researchers. In fact, we've already covered one of their books, The Meme Humanoid. They also publish the companion books to Somewhere in the Skies by Ryan Sprague. But that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. 
Tonight, we're talking about tinfoil hats. And really, that title kind of clues you in to Zelia's wry sense of humor that is sprinkled throughout this entire book. But what exactly is this book about? This book is an examination of high strangeness through a series of specific cases. But before we get to any conclusions, we need to take a look at the cases themselves. So without further ado, let's get weird. The first case we're going to look at is the Flatwoods Monster. Because I have to, it's from West Virginia. Now, some of you may know this as the Braxton County Monster, but really it's the same entity and the same event. The Flatwoods Monster is recognized worldwide, and oddly enough, it has kind of a cult following in Japan. I have no idea why, but they just love this little guy. In fact, he's so beloved that he is even a major villain in the video game The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. But what are the origins of the Flatwoods Monster? It all began on September 12, 1952, with two brothers, Freddy and Edward May. This happened when Freddy was 12 years old and Edward was around 13. It took place around 7 p.m. when they saw a pear-shaped object that was glowing red land on a nearby hilltop. The two brothers decided they wanted to check this out, but they didn't want to go alone, so they gathered together four of their friends from the local neighborhood. One of the boys, Teddy Neal, was convinced that this was a meteorite, and he really just wanted to go rock collecting. Not to spoil anything, but this event really did not turn out how he expected it would. On the way to the crash site, they stopped by the May household where Freddie and Edward's mother asked them where they were going. One of the boys, named Ronald Shaver, piped up and says, We're going to go find a crashed flying saucer! Whether or not he was being serious at the time is still up for debate. Mother May didn't want the boys traipsing around in the woods after dark alone, so she decided to go with them. But before they left, she stopped at their neighbor's house and asked Eugene Lemon, who was a 17-year-old National Guardsman, if he would go with them. When they got to the hilltop, the first thing they noticed was a strange reddish-purple glow. Which, yeah, that is super weird. Following that, they noticed a strange warm mist that emitted a sulfuric smell, and it burned their eyes and nose. One of the boys... Eugene Lemon had brought his dog with him, and once the dog noticed the mist, he started growling, and he ran into it. At some point, they heard the dog barking, and then he ran out of there in terror and went back to town. Despite popular mythology, the dog did not die from his exposure to the mist. He actually lived quite a few years after the event. So the first thing that the witnesses claimed to have seen was an object about the size of an outhouse that was pointed on top. Many of them said that it was a black object, but Ronald Shaver said that it specifically looked to be in the process of becoming red hot. While they were searching the crash site, Mother May commented that she saw the eyes of an opossum or a raccoon shining down from a nearby tree. One of the boys, named Neil Nunley, had the only flashlight in the group, and upon Mother May's comment, he turned the beam onto the eyes. The following passage is a great example of Zelia's humor. She says, quote, Neil turned his flashlight in that direction, and, needless to say, the beam didn't rest upon a friendly neighborhood garbage gourmand. Going into this story, I thought I knew what the Flatwoods monster looked like, mostly through popular culture. But... It seems that I was wrong. Pop culture has the general form of this creature correct, but it's the details that aren't quite right. The one thing that everyone could agree upon was that the creature was metallic in nature. It stood about six feet tall, but it was hovering several feet above the ground. It seemed to have a spade-shaped collar or hood. Nobody was really sure. It also had a bright red, helmet-like head. 
The bright green torso was cylindrical, and it flared outward from the waist similar to a skirt. Despite how it's commonly depicted, there was no mention of claws or arms. What the witnesses assumed were eyes appeared to be two glowing orbs behind a translucent panel or a porthole in the helmet. These eyes didn't just glow, but they shone like beams of a flashlight. Artist renditions make it look like there's goggles on a helmet of this creature, but really it sounds more like there were flashlights or beams coming from behind a diver's helmet or something along those lines. In later interviews, Mother May is reported as saying, It was worse than Frankenstein! The Universal movie was currently in theaters, and apparently Frankenstein was the most hideous thing that she could think of on the spot. So when Neil shone his flashlight upon this creature, they noticed that its eyes shone into the sky. But when the beam of the flashlight struck it, its eyes turned towards them. The metallic monster began to glide towards the group. As it approached, it began hissing and emitting more of that mist from beneath its skirt. This was all too much for young Eugene Lemon, who immediately fainted on the spot. In fact, his friends had to half-drag him back to town when they all fled. Later, they were all checked out by a doctor, who said they all shared symptoms of being afflicted with mustard gas. If this were the case, it had to be a rather low-grade mustard gas, because mustard gas clings to the ground, and the first thing affected by it would have been the dog, and ultimately, the dog was fine. When the witnesses got back to town and told their story, it all ended up very much like the movie Frankenstein. A gun-toting posse was formed, and a bunch of people went into the woods looking for the monster. Ultimately, there were no signs of the creature, nor the outhouse-shaped object. Close on the heels of the posse were newspaper reporters, who also didn't find anything, although many of them did recount a sickening odor that still lingered in the area. It was also noted that there were two circles of trampled brush on the hilltop. Unsatisfied with the results of the search party, Mrs. May later returned to the crash site, where she found oily skid marks in the ground. Despite that, no more evidence was ever located. Adding to the veracity of this event, there were multiple reports that night made of falling stars, meteors, and flaming objects falling from the sky, all of which led to Flatwoods. In the wake of this event, we see that there is this sensationalization of the creature, turning it from a robot into more of a monster. Additionally, story features were added, such as the death of the dog and the creature's claw-tipped arms. What's interesting about this event is that the description of the creature seems logical for something that would have come from off-planet. If extraterrestrial life were going to examine humanity, they wouldn't come themselves. They would send either a drone or a robot, or they would show up with heavy protective equipment on. And that's a feature that you normally don't see in alien encounters. In most descriptions, the alien entities don't have any additional breathing apparatus, or oftentimes even a helmet. In the wake of this event, Project Blue Book even showed up and investigated, and their ultimate conclusion was that the witnesses simply saw an owl. But I find that suspect, considering that initially, the witnesses thought that the eyes came from a possum or a raccoon demonstrating that they were familiar with local wildlife. Besides, I don't know about you, but I've never seen an owl with eyes like beams of a flashlight. Next up, we have the Kelly Little Silver Men, or the Hopkinsville Hobgoblins. These entities were popularized by the Planet Weird series Hellier, but did you know they began as space aliens? If you've ever heard the term Little Green Men in reference towards space aliens, 
This is the story where that came from. Only, they weren't green. That part was totally made up by a reporter, being that this came from Kelly, Kentucky, and that's associated with Kelly Green, so this became the Kelly Green Men, and people just shortened this into the Little Green Men. Anyway, this all began on August 21st, 1955, as I said, in Kelly, Kentucky. Billy Ray Taylor and his wife June were visiting with the Sutton family at their homestead. At some point that night, Billy Ray went outside to collect water from the well. While he was there, he looked up into the sky, and he saw a silver spaceship shooting out rainbow-colored flames. That ship glided through the sky, suddenly stopped, and then dropped into a gully behind the homestead. Now, Billy Ray went inside and told everybody what he just saw, and frankly, nobody believed him. As a result, nobody went to investigate. Now, around 8 p.m. that night, it's reported that the dog began to, quote, act up, at which point it ran under the house and refused to leave until the next day. That's when Elmer Sutton noticed a glowing light out in the field. That light was slowly moving towards the house. As it got closer, they noticed that the light was coming from a rather strange-looking creature. The figure was about three and a half feet tall, had a bulbous, bald head, long pointed ears, and huge, unblinking yellow eyes. Its mouth was lipless and looked like a simple slit in its face, and had spindly limbs with clawed hands. The oddest part is that the skin was silvery and self-luminous as long as it was in shadow. Billy Ray and Elmer did what any Kentuckian would do in the 1950s when encountered with something like this. They grabbed their guns. Billy Ray was armed with a 22 caliber rifle, which means that he could shoot them at a distance. But Elmer, he had a 12-gauge shotgun, which isn't great for a distance, but it will come in handy later. So when these two come face to face with a goblin, they obviously open fire. This is where things get really, really weird. The goblins, one struck by gunfire, don't act like normal. In fact, they act more like a carnival attraction. When shot, that first creature flipped head over heels, slowly glided to the ground, and when it touched down, it ran back into the forest. Billy Ray and Elmer turned to walk back into the house when they heard another gunshot coming from the window. It seems that the creature was not alone. That second creature, just like the first, flipped over when it was shot, but instead of running back to the forest, it glided. At this stage, all three men decided that they should go find the bodies of these creatures that they just shot. The moment that Billy Ray stepped off the front porch, a clawed hand reached down from the top of the roof and grabbed him by the hair. This is where that shotgun comes in super handy. It says that Elmer opened fire on this creature. The report isn't clear where Elmer was when he started shooting, so in my mind, he's firing through the ceiling of the porch. As wooden splinters rain down in the front yard, they see the creature, who just got shot, slowly glide down to the ground, drop to all fours, and scurry away. Suddenly, one of the men spotted another goblin in a tree, and another just walked around the corner of the house and started to approach them. These things were everywhere. This is where we get a direct quote from one of the witnesses. He says, it looked like a five-gallon gasoline can with a head on top and small legs. It was a shimmering bright metal, like my refrigerator. Over the course of the night, the families fought off six waves of these creatures as they approached the house. At some point, the family matriarch was under the impression that they weren't dangerous, they were just trying to communicate, and she begged the boys to stop firing, which obviously they didn't. 
Now, this first encounter all took place between the hours of 8 p.m. and 11 p.m., at which point all the families piled into their vehicles and drove to get the sheriff. They returned with a whole slew of police and reporters. As you can guess, they didn't really find much. One thing they did find, though, was a patch of luminous grass that faded upon inspection. While it was noted in the report, it was mostly just as a novelty. By 2.30 in the morning, all the investigators had already left, and the family had settled down for bed. Only an hour later, the goblins returned. Neighbors told reporters that they heard gunshots all night long, until about half an hour before sunrise, when everything suddenly got very quiet. The goblins had finally retreated for good. Now, it's said that Project Blue Book unofficially investigated this, which makes me think that J. Allen Hynek just showed up and started poking around on his own time. Unofficially, two results were recorded. The first, the family was all drunk. This was disputed by the chief of police, who, upon investigation, found no evidence of excessive drinking. In fact, the matriarch of the family expressly forbade liquor in the household. The second possibility that was proposed is honestly more bizarre than the encounter itself. It's theorized that the house was besieged by a train full of monkeys that escaped from the circus. Glowing, bulletproof, metallic monkeys. That makes way more sense than goblins, right? To this day, we still have no probable theories and no real answers. Next up, we have what I feel is the best chapter title of the entire book. John Trasco meets the Space Leprechauns. This all begins on November 6, 1957, in Everettstown, New Jersey, and it centers around a large, mean-tempered dog named King. When Trasco came home from work, he went outside to feed his dog. That's when he was approached by what he describes as a two-and-a-half-foot-tall man with a putty-colored face, frog-like eyes, a green suit with shiny buttons, gloves with shiny objects on the tips of each finger, and a green tam o shanter hat. When I first read this, I pictured the thing wearing a fez, even though I know that a fez is called a fez. Turns out a tam o shanter is what you think of as those floppy hats that Highlanders wear. You know, the ones with the balls on top? Yeah, one of those. The little man looked at Trasco and said, We are a peaceful people. We don't want no trouble. We just want your dog. To which Trasco replied, You get the hell out of here! While this was all going on, Trasco's wife was looking out the window at another part of the property. She says that she saw a luminous egg-shaped object 9 to 12 feet long near their barn. Her initial description is exceptionally strange because at first she said that she thought it was a puddle reflecting moonlight. But the more that she looked at it, she realized that it was a physical 3D object. After Trasco told this creature to leave, it shrugs and goes, meh, and walks back into this egg-shaped object. And I mean that literally. This object didn't appear to have any means of entry. It then, quote, lifted into the air like a flame. When Trasco went back in, his wife noticed that there was a green powder on his wrist. When she asked him about this, he says that he tried to grab one of them, which implies that there was more than one entity, although the story discounts that. The powder washed off quite easily, although he did find some under his fingernails the next day. While the Trascos never saw the entities again, they were disturbed by two stationary lights hovering above their home. When later interviewed, Mrs. Trasco lamented that she wished that John had just given up the dog. She says that it was, quote, so cross that she couldn't think of anybody else who would want it. Flicks. 
The Ghost of Conser Lake. This story begins, as all good Bigfoot stories, with a shaggy white gorilla keeping pace with a delivery truck. The driver said that the creature must have been moving about 35 miles per hour and seemed to be interested in the vehicle itself. Later accounts report a bulletproof creature that screamed like a cat and left huge footprints. These accounts were also usually associated with weird light phenomena or even UFOs. On July 31, 1960, several youths reported a giant white creature near Conser Lake. Its appearance was reported to look both like a gorilla and like a polar bear. The strangest part of this report is that every time it stepped, it made a squishing noise. When the kids returned to town and reported this to the authorities, the results were predictable. A gun-toting posse was formed. For weeks after the sighting, monster hunters continued to haunt the lake. Frankly, it became dangerous to even be along the shoreline. In one police report, a teenage boy was fishing along the bank when he heard, There he is! as two bullets whizzed past his head. It got so bad that the local paper implored people to please, please be careful when monster hunting. This creature isn't your typical Bigfoot, though. Reports from around the area describe footprints that are huge and webbed like a duck's. At one point, he even behaved like a peeping Tom looking in people's windows. When they went to investigate the next morning, people would find giant handprints on the side of their homes. In one of the strangest encounters, it was reported that the creature circled a vehicle looking in through the windows. The witnesses, though, said that the creature had no facial features. There were a few commonalities in all these encounters, though. One is the Oz effect, where everything around you goes completely silent. And the other, the witnesses report having headaches as a result of their encounter. During this time, Betty Westby was searching the lake for the monster as a part of her ongoing series of articles. One day, she decided to get a little unconventional, and she took a local telepath with her. While they searched the lake, the telepath began to receive messages. The first was that the creature did not like to be called a monster. Instead, visitor or alien would be preferred, but creature, creature would do. Furthermore, he gave himself a name. He said, quote, I am called Flix. There are many like me, but I am the one called Flix. This wasn't the only psychic encounter with this creature. Alvin Hammock went out searching, but before he did so, he mentally projected an idea of peace and trust. He told the creature, You don't have to be afraid. You can trust me. In reply, he got a telepathic message in his head. How do I know that I can? Apparently, this was the last recorded encounter with the creature known as Flix. The next chapter that I want to review is called The Three Ring Circus of Cisco Grove. And I can assure you, there are no glowing metallic bulletproof monkeys involved. This encounter happened to 26-year-old Donald Shrum on September 4, 1964, in Placer County, California. Donald had gone bow hunting with two of his friends deep in the woods. They stayed out most of the day, and each of them got lost on the way back to camp. Eventually, Donald's two companions met up with each other and found their way back to their tents. But Donald... Well, he was out after dark, and rather than wander around the woods, he decided to climb a tree to avoid bears for the night. From this vantage point, Donald noticed a strange light on the horizon. He'd been gone for a while, so he assumed that his friends called in a helicopter for search and rescue. He climbed down out of the tree and lit three signal fires to alert the helicopter of his location. The light began to move towards him, but when he noticed that there was no searchlight, that's when he began to get suspicious. 
As it got closer, he noticed that it didn't emit any sound. Clearly, this was not a helicopter. Shrum quickly scrambled back into his hiding spot in the tree. From there, he watched the approach of this craft. He described it as being roughly 150 feet long and oval-shaped. Shrum refers to this vessel as the mothership because a second dome-shaped object dropped from within the first. He recounts that that second vessel landed about a mile away from his current location. It didn't take long before he started to hear something crashing through the brush in his direction. Finally, the creature emerged. It stood about five feet tall and seemed to be wearing a silver suit with odd puffs at the joints. Its face was flat and dark, and Shrum wasn't sure if it was wearing a helmet or not. It had a nose-like protrusion low on its face, and seemed to have eyes that resembled welding goggles. While Donald was observing this creature, a second one arrived. Together, they searched the area, and eventually made their way to the base of the tree. And simultaneously, they both looked up at Donald. He says that he could hear cooing or hooting noises, and when this happened, both creatures turned and looked at the mothership. After a short time, a third entity showed up, only this one was huge. This third entity looked to be robotic. It had jointed fingers and a hinged jaw mechanism, and its eyes were fiery red-orange. As it approached the other two entities, it kicked aside the remaining embers of the dying signal fires that Donald had previously lit. In an odd motion, the robot reached up, unhinged its jaw, and began to emit a cloud of vapor. Immediately, Donald began to feel himself passing out. He very quickly regained consciousness and made a solemn decision to fight back. He knocked an arrow drew back his bow, and aimed for the robot. Releasing the arrow, it struck the creature in the chest. There was a flash of light, and it staggered backwards. All three entities retreated into the forest. Over time, they re-emerged, and again, Donald fired an arrow at the robot. There was another flash, and the trio retreated again. This scene played out until Donald no longer had any arrows remaining. Again, the two entities that Donald believed to be biological came to the base of the tree. Remembering how the robot reacted to the fire, he decided to try a different tactic. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a matchbook. He lit a single match and dropped it towards the two entities. This worked way better than he expected because the two entities fled in terror. Not only that, but the mothership disappeared. As the dying light of that single match faded, the two entities returned to the tree. Shrum began to burn anything that he had on his person. His camouflage clothing, any article of paper, old receipts, he even went as far as to burn his money. Eventually, the only things he had remaining were his bow, his blue jeans, and a t-shirt. And here he was, in the middle of the night, stuck in a tree, on a mountaintop in California, surrounded by alien entities. With few other options, Donald Shrum climbed higher in the tree and tied himself to the trunk with his belt. Seeing this, the robot looked up and again emitted that noxious vapor. When Donald regained consciousness, he looked down and saw the two biological entities were now climbing the tree. Doing the only thing he could, he began to shake the treetop. As the tree began to sway, the two entities clambered down, and again, the robot gassed him. This happened a few more times, and eventually Shroom just threw his empty canteen at them as they were halfway up the trunk. They climbed back down, inspected the canteen, and then casually threw it away over their shoulder. Next, he began to throw his pocket change at them. 
which apparently was super fascinating to these aliens. Every time a coin dropped, they would stop what they were doing, search for it, and collect it. In fact, they were so fascinated with these coins that they actually took them with them when they left. While this was all going on, three or four other entities showed up, but they were not directly engaging with Donald or the other two entities in any way. Instead, they were examining the surrounding plant life. As dawn approached, a second robot arrived. It met up with the first, they faced each other, and there was a series of flashes. They both simultaneously emitted more of that vapor, and Donald passed out, this time for much, much longer. By the time he awoke, the sun had risen, and Donald Shroom was alone. Thanks to the way these creatures communicated, Donald had a lingering fear of owls for the remainder of his life. So what in the world is going on with all of these super weird encounters? Honestly, it's hard to say. All that we can do is look at the commonalities in all of these events. The first thing that we notice is that pretty much all of these involve some sort of light phenomena. As Zelia writes, quote, One of the strangest aspects Regarding light anomalies, however, is how often they seem to serve as the catalyst for an encounter. There's usually something far, far stranger going on, but that light, that light is almost always present. Next is the idea that these encounters, and the entities specifically, are usually paradoxical in nature in some way. They seem to be physical entities, but they're also bulletproof and lighter than a feather. They glow, but they're invisible. They leave gigantic webbed footprints, and yet they can vanish on sight. They're real, and yet they're not. Finally, there's the potential for these to be symbolic in nature. Tonight we heard a bunch of robotic-looking entities, organic entities, and a combination of the two. Even the craft in which they travel has a common egg shape. In another context, these encounters would be less sci-fi and more shamanic, in which case we would interpret them more figuratively rather than literally. In conclusion, I want to leave you with this quote from the book. The paranormal, the unexplained, the supernatural, the unknown, whatever you call it, is an important part of the human condition, and I suspect that, for all of our searching, one day it may be uncovered that the truth is not only out there, but also within ourselves. This was only a small selection of the 23 stories that are enclosed in this book. And I can assure you, every single one of these is some sort of high strangeness. Every encounter will leave you scratching your head. And honestly, that is the theme of the book. These things are probably not meant to be explained. They're made to make us think. More specifically, they're not made for us. They were made for the person who encountered them. These events are a catalyst for change. But change for the person who was involved. The rest of us are only getting second and third hand gnosis. As the story is passed down, it loses some of its impact, some of its meaning. And when you strip away all of those layers, all that's left is mythology. But enough of me being philosophical. Let's talk about the book itself. This book contains a ton of information, but it's also very easy to read. This is one of the few times where I can say that preparing for this episode was fun. 
Zelia has a very conversational writing style, which makes the stories flow. You don't even realize that you've gone through 20 pages and you're on to the next case file. I encountered some missing time while preparing for this, and it had nothing to do with aliens. I was just lost in a book. This is one of the few instances where the book is both informative and enjoyable. And that's not something you get too often in the paranormal field. So if you're looking for tales of high strangeness that will leave you scratching your head, definitely grab this book because it is one of the best collections that I have ever run into. Additionally, Zelia's reflections on the cases are oftentimes insightful, and they build an overarching narrative that you really don't understand until you get to the end of the book. And it's because of this that you can tell that she takes after the investigative style of John Keel. She tells the stories. She weaves a narrative. And at the end, she reveals her hypothesis. And as strange as it may sound, it comes across as rather plausible. As always, I'll have a link to the book in the show notes. Intro and outro music is courtesy of Sarah Rudy and her band Hello June. You can find more of their stuff at bandcamp.com or at wearehellojune.com. The Esoteric Book Club can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, and at esotericbookclub.org. Archive members, stick around. We've got creepy clowns to talk about. The rest of you, until next time, remember, stay weird. It's time once again to open the Esoteric Archive. Tonight we're taking a look at the story of Sandown Sam. Now this story takes place on the Isle of Wight in 1973. It involves two children, one boy and one girl, both of whom are anonymous for reasons that you'll see throughout the story. Hey everyone, Natalie here from the Pendulum's Path. If you need guidance, direction, spiritual connection, or more, then listen up. I have worked as a psychic and a medium for over three years, connecting people from all over the world with their loved ones in spirit, giving them insight and guidance into their current situations, the past healings that need to be worked on, and what it is they need to know today in order to have a better future. It would be my absolute honor if you would visit my website at www.thependulumspath.com. I also offer emailed readings for those with busy schedules too. Also, for you goblins who subscribe to the Esoteric Book Club, I have a special coupon code just for you. Enter the code STAYWEIRD to get $5 off of any order of $25 or more. Hope to see you there.